record this one because I want to work on this for another particular um, issue further down the line. Okay, so in chapter one, they want to lay out um, how the foundations of archaeology are established. And last time we um, looked at a couple of situations from ancient Egypt, from Mesopotamia, from um, ancient Greeks, um, that there's been a recorded um, interest. And, and again, no doubt about it, it's just that we don't have um, empirical data to recover, right? Nothing written or inscribed, that ancient populations have been looking at things that are abandoned or left behind or that they didn't create, and it spikes curiosity. Whether your question is something that's spiritual um, because it seems to be supernatural or related to ritual or, or some other form of power structure, whether you're interested in the history of your own society or whether you're interested in learning about other um, cultural groups or just collecting curiosities and lovely things that you find that you don't know, know exactly what they were used for or, or who made them. So there we go. All right, welcome. For that one. So all those all those things were going on in the ancient world. And we also know they were going on in the Americas as well. We have lots of data about uh, very well known um, uh, societies of indigenous societies in the ancient Americas, um, going to, to sites of older extinct cultures and digging around and digging up things and bringing those um, relics, which they interpreted as having religious purpose back home. Okay, so this is what I call ancient interest. Um, we then got along to uh, just about start at the speculative phase and the growth of antiquarianism. So let's take a look at this. So this is where we're picking up from last time. In your readings, um, it, this particular phase is where it says the um, speculative phase um, about page 22 on that and it does go through um, to the areas that say antiquity of humankind, the three age system, um, ethnography, and a couple of others. So it, it does run on for a couple pages there for you. All right, so collectors speculative phase and antiquarianism. Uh, it is true that today we do classify much of what was going on in this particular period of time legally as looting or ethically, um, perhaps in that way. And I know there's a lot of, of dialogue and, um, and commentary, and there's a lot going on today um, legally in many, many places of the world where um, people are saying that other countries or museums or other spots need to return a tremendous number of things back to where they originally came, came from because they want them. Um, but this is very complicated and it's why it's not a simple um, pattern. In some cases, the people who actually took them out of the country bought the entire property from whoever claimed to be the owner and then as owners of the property then took it back to wherever they wanted to um, take it or gave it to a museum or sold it off or other things. So it's complicated, but we are seeing that in many instances, at least portions of things that have been removed from certain places in the world, especially if the items are particularly neat, are being resent back um, to where they first came from in order to be on display as natural patrimony. So lots is going on. All right, so what is antiquarianism? All right, come up here so you don't have to look at all of it all at one time. Hello. Okay. The, Antiquarianism is also related sometimes to the growth of national movements um, in Western society. And so an antiquarian, simple enough, is that group of individuals who are interested in just collecting artifacts. Remember, an artifact will be something that's portable and um, has whatever uh, type of evidence that it was used, manipulated, shaped, or created by people. So this starts to happen um, noticeably in the 1500s in Europe, 
and around the Mediterranean. Um, we're not exactly sure for every area of the world when it gets started, because sometimes we just don't have that history. So what was the goal of this? The goal is probably very similar uh, to a lot of things that's still going on today, which was to collect, to get a big personal collections of things that were rare or that uh, triggered your imagination um, or that seemed to be mystical or that friends and family or your society would be very impressed that you had collected those particular um, items. And um, again, linked mostly with, right, wealthy or privileged travelers. So for those of you that are in anthro programs in general, so within a more cultural anthropology viewpoint for antiquarianism, even in this particular period of time, the things that were, they were collecting or accumulating or purchasing or going out and acquiring are cultural enhancing status markers. So they are going to be linking having these things as their own property or in their own house or garden or so forth as something that makes them appear more important um, or more worldly in their society. Later on, antiquarianism, this collecting, bringing it home, shipping it home, that sort of thing, movement, shifted into um, goals that had to do with nationalism in many cases. And this is when the personal collections of these people that are amassing, uh, sometimes they're just getting anything from anywhere, but a lot of times it's very similar to the type of collecting um, that we see um, still going on today because antiquarianism isn't really gone as an activity um, where they're mainly interested in things from just one area. They just collect Chinese jades or they just want things from ancient Central America or they just want statuary or marble um, carved items or in some cases much, much more. So as um, some of these individuals begin to turn them into museums that other people can walk through, so right, displays, then it starts to become associated with the country or the nationality that's going on. And eventually those collectors um, who already were privileged individuals become socially acknowledged as prominent donors or patrons of these things. Now, one of the things that is going on that has produced lots of impact on the modern world and lots of, um, lots of legal things, lots of um, antagonism, um, and sometimes lots of very nice gestures of returning things is in some cases, the collectors, the antiquarians, were not getting just artifacts, they were bringing home entire features. <clears throat> so if you visited uh, some of the famous um, and um, long term older museum um, things here in the United States, particularly on the East Coast, um, I've been in some where you walk into one of the floors of a museum and there is an entire reproduced Japanese tea house, the whole building completely taken apart and all the way brought in. And again, this is chapter one. This is the very first chapter of your reading that is embedded in, um, embedded in canvas. So in this particular case, we're talking about, right, history of archeology, span the searchers. So I'm adding some background to the basics as we go, but more or less the same ideas are, are present there. Um, in some of the Metropolitan Museum system in New York, New York City, there are entire Egyptian temples. So when they built the building and they knew that someone was going to donate an entire Egyptian temple that was taken apart, stone by stone, labeled and reassembled, they made the ceiling height high enough to actually make those big enough. So for people that are never going to get to leave, 
their home country because they don't have the money or it's a historic period of time where that's not something that people do or it's a global situation where the country of origin is not safe or welcoming perhaps to people from other places of the world or one particular place of the world and these things that go into museums will be their only way that they can personally come in contact closer contact visually and sometimes touch um, these uh, these items however it does mean that something that was part of another region's patrimony or historic record has now been completely removed from its point of origin now this starts a really long time ago at least a couple thousand years ago where we see this um, urge for certain social classes to collect as much as possible um, or when possible. So one of the groups that were very um, prolific, we would call it looting, where we would just go in, conquer an area and bring everything home. Today, they didn't consider it that way. They just considered it the treasures that you got when you were victorious. Um, and that was the mode of the day. That isn't who we are today, hopefully. Um, so they were bringing home sculpture and other objects to decorate their homes and gardens. That was a record of where they'd been, who they were, and other groups that they dominated. This particular image here is um, from the about 1960s. And this is a young couple uh, who at the time were living in Los Angeles. The uh, young man that you can see here in the dark sweater was actually a socially prominent um, guy who had gotten his start as a very um, talented jockey, uh, racehorses owned by a very, very wealthy person. And so he married a young woman with very wealthy um, parents um, because he had social status from his jockeying. And in this particular um, photograph that was taken for showing to the public and for publication. I don't think it was in a book. I think it was more of a magazine article. They're showing off who they are by sitting in front of, so they're on a sort of a, a, a padded footstool kind of thing, a big one, um, Ottoman um, collection of really ancient ceramic materials that come from um, the modern day countries of Mexico. And in one of these cases, this one is most likely from the modern day nation of Guatemala. So uh, these that you can see this dog here and this pair of ducks. And then also both of these two um, containers on the upper shelf. Um, this one sitting here on the side of the middle shelf that's shiny and then the two figures here at the bottom all of these come from the modern day mexican states of um, jalisco colima and nayarit and they are all looted from tombs these all came from burials um, at the time though that they were purchasing them the laws for purchasing them were not firmly set and they did pay a large price um, for the items it is totally illegal now and it has been for uh, quite a long time but so much of it left the country neither of these people actually had any family members from that part of the world, which is interesting that that's what they were interested in collecting. But I think that some of you do know that uh, these particular items from West Mexico, all of which at the time that they purchased them were approximately 2000 years old and in perfect condition, right? Because they came from an underground tomb, not, not just a, a cemetery uh, burial, but an actual building uh, structure that was dug out underground. Um, but this was also very, very highly popularized by a leading antiquarian, antiquarian nationalist collector who was a Mexican national, Diego Rivera and his wife, Rita Kahlo. So they were following the social norm to love that stuff. 
and um, linking who they were and how important and sophisticated their interests were with other people that were very famous artists and collectors. And this is how this gains a lot of momentum. Beyond uh, this, just in case you're interested in the others, this one here um, comes from the modern day state of um, Oaxaca, and it is uh, created by um, ancient population called Sacuatec. This one appears even older, comes up from closer to Mexico City, um, probably even more than a thousand years old. And this one is probably the youngest item that they have, but it's a gargantuan uh, jar. All of these things would have been thousands of dollars to purchase even in 1950. Okay, so yeah, we're still doing it too, right? Um, if you look at some of those um, uh, magazines, Architectural Digest type magazines and things like that, you'll often see that part of the roaming through a wealthy person's house or garden shows that they have purchased many, many ancient things um, from around the world, hopefully those that were acquired legally, but not always. Here's another one. In the 1930s, you had people from various places in the world, primarily Europeans, going to what we today call the Middle East. Um, and um, again, no legal restrictions on this, but they were either hiring local workers to investigate and then remove things or purchasing property um, or paying local authorities in order to um, come across these things. So here is um, this. It, when it was first recovered. This is a black and white photo, but you can see these animals here on this um, tile uh, surfaces. This giant thing, which we now call the Ishtar Gate, which was part of ancient Babylon, um, was then removed, cleaned, and reassembled and is present in a museum in Berlin called the Pergamon. Um, so Middle Eastern countries would like these things returned and sometimes, uh, yeah, and sometimes some of this, as some of you are probably thinking right now, moving things at that particular period of time into Berlin when it was getting ready for a war cycle where many of these museums were utterly destroyed and everything in them uh, was as well. Um, as part of this, oh, you, you can't always just protect them. However, sometimes not sending them back to certain areas that are having problems with looting, destruction, um, cultural movements where they don't want to save certain things from their past. And so those things are being burned or um, demolished or, uh, you know, erased in some way or another is also part of the conversation. So again, later on in the course, we'll talk about this whole concept and the laws, uh, international laws and so forth. But as you can see, again, though, it does bring something to another area of the world where people can see how insanely magnificent this was. And this is um, something close onto the 3,000 years old um, um, record. So what happens between the beginnings of antiquarianism and the movement that we call today the Renaissance. Uh, because the Renaissance it reawakens the interest in not only the arts, but also science and collecting information and writing about the information. And so in your chapter one reading where it talks about, um, again, how science begins to play a role in archeology span and now plays the dominant role in archeology span when it's being conducted um, legally and ethically, um, where does this come from? So changes that are happening during the Renaissance do actually begin, but it's really, really slow to change the way people are interacting with archeological materials or ancient sites. Um, it does with this reawakened interest in learning things, it initially just makes it so that more people are traveling and looking around. They did discover things, but they didn't necessarily start having ideas about how to really um, work projects at this particular period of time. So for instance, and this would be uh, very surprising probably to a lot of people in the planet, Pompeii was looked at by outsiders and they did dig a few holes and look around and see that the whole, um, everything was still under the ground. Everyone knew where it was because there were eyewitnesses to the eruption um, and, um, for people out in boats in the harbors. Most of Pompeii was evacuated voluntarily prior to the eruption. It doesn't look like a huge number of people stayed at home, uh, but some did. And we also know 
from more modern archaeological excavation that many um, homeowners, if they had slaves or household servants, chained them to the property to act as uh, security guards as the main family left in case of the full eruption. Um, they also left dogs, chains to the gates, and so forth. So some of you have seen the uh, discovery of some of those corpses of individuals um, there, not all of whom were wanting to be there. They just were, um, yeah, because the chains are still present, so they can see that they were not able to leave. So wealthy people were traveling to places that were mentioned in literature, um, and that began to build, build, build. Some of you that are literature majors have probably read quite a bit of uh, books of classic Western literature that, from this particular period of time. So they were bringing home things um, for display over time. Less wealthy people were following the same pattern, and this is how we get it into um, what they're talking about for a general interest for middle class and um, much, much um, more widespread um, in societies. Since wealthy people were doing it, they had established that it made you stand out or be a more interesting member of your society if you took an interest in ancient things. So people who couldn't travel started to get more interested in ancient things that were in their own backyard, in their own country, in their own region. So um, Scandinavia and Britain, uh, early on, you see this as a social movement for or a social interest for something more, much more like the middle class. So you get locals that want to dig around places like Stonehenge or Barrows, um, like you're reading about for Bormashoy and the case studies. And so that going from just the high status elite activity down, filtering down to the majority of the population. Okay, so what does it look like? Do we have any photos of um, antiquarian uh, collections or uh, information on these antiquarian societies? One of the things that's really fascinating about it is one, how old these collections that people would then invite other people to see. So yeah, this, in if we were just looking at it in English, it, it looks like it says old worm, um, which makes it seem funny, but it was Ole Worm. And so it's an actual Scandinavian name. And he created his own museum named after himself, Vermianum, in the middle 1600s. And so this was illustrated, um, and then there were flyers about people coming. But you can see that it was everything in these antiquarian collections um, and so forth. So we've got animal bones, artifacts, things that are imported from travelers or um, uh, ocean um, business um, from all over the place. He's got stuff like turtle shells that are coming from someplace else in the world, um, other kinds of things, artifacts, farm tools, uh, animal skeletons. It just goes on and on. This interest still persists today. Curiosity cabinets have their own fandom. There's still lots of people that make and create and celebrate and are invigorated by curiosity cabinets. Um, you can find um, images of them, everything from Pinterest to other kinds of activities. And again, even looking at photographs, for instance, of Charles Darwin's um, the work area, his home library office that he, he worked in while he was doing the writing of his many, many books and um, thinking about things and doing other kinds of personal, personally, in, things that personally interested him. And so uh, here's just a photo of one type of these things where you've got some natural objects, um, a, a cranium here of something. This is looks to be a very large dog, um, but could be something else um, very similar. We've got some other things that are human made, a little artifact here, bird feathers, some chemistry, some geology, some geography. So some of you might have noticed that here, if I move over to the side, I'm one of these people that has my own cabinet of curiosities. 
it's um, for me though nothing's looted so it's either reproductions of things things made by hand that are copies of ancient things that i've gotten by traveling i have quite a few um, bones of different kinds of species and there's a um, yeah, what else is in there there's some um, antique chemistry equipment there's a little bit of artwork from my mom. I've got a little um, legally obtained um, statue of a Catholic saint that um, came originally from uh, not Mexico, but further south and so forth. So um, this still with us today, even me. Um, the Society of Antiquaries in London was a prominent, a prominent um, group as well. So this movement to collect as many things as possible and get them in one place, and that's the main idea here that leads to scientific analysis. Bringing things into one area where everything can be compared and contrasted to each other, and people begin to think about making an inventory or doing an analysis. So what's the long-term benefit of this? How does it move towards us having a activity that allows us to understand the past? Again, eventually we get this idea that when you're bringing things together that you might want to, um, while you're just doing, a, even just for insurance or to, um, for your inheritance, uh, you're putting it in your will of who gets what, you're going to end up with these listings of what there is and what you think it is, and then perhaps begin to put them in categories where they're similar or not. Sharing information in a public setting. The more people that have access to seeing these things, the more then you'll have different ideas about what it is you're looking at. Now in chapter one, it really emphasizes this concept that it takes a variety of perspectives looking at the past in order to begin to come forward with conclusions or analyses that are accurate, that actually are starting to uh, illuminate what actually happened, not somebody's romantic idea of what they've got. So for instance, in chapter one, where it says part one, 19th century pioneers of North American archeology, span it runs through um, talking about just a couple people there who move from looking at antiquities in what today is the United States and, um, and writing these imaginative and completely racially unfair um, analyses that these were all made by things like the lost tribes of Israel or um, cultures that are extinct or cultures from some other place um, to people beginning to say, well, you know what? I looked at all that you found. I'm looking what I found. And this looks exactly like what the Native American tribes that live in this area today are still making and doing. And so again, as it moves on, so opening up the data to outside viewpoints um, goes this. We also see legally and politically around the world that there becomes a movement to um, draw attention to the donors, which motivates them over time to give more of those things forward for the public to see or for academics to look at, for universities to study and so forth. Um, and one of the ways they do it is by attaching their names to the buildings. So, and another way they do it is by getting a giant tax write-off for tax benefit by donating a very, very expensive items. So the donors of the wealthy, once they see that other people are collecting things too, then in order for them to stay on top, they need to do something that no one else can do. And this gives them even more cultural status. So places that are called the Carnegie, um, the Guggenheim and so forth in the US, just named after the big donors, after the super wealthy collectors. So those collections, what's our most recent step that we're seeing um, uh, today for one of these is that museums are starting to, except for that it's very slow and um, it's just going to take a while for it to go a little bit more. They're beginning to not only have public displays of, of things where you've got information or walkthroughs or people that will be there and can answer questions, but they're also beginning to um, 
evaluate these or uh, I'm going to say just say photograph because it's faster, right? They're going to do the type of photographic sequences that you embed in computer programs so that people can see a 360 view of things that are in storage that are never going to be on display. So they're trying to open up the millions of objects that never get out on the museum floor that are in um, enclosed um, storage because they're too fragile, they can't be in the sunlight, there's too many of them, um, there'll be other sorts of things so that people can look at them. And then the, one of the more recent steps is there's some objects that are being um, recorded in a manner so that you can download the info and print copies of them on your 3D printer. So that's starting to happen. The piece of all of this is super increasing. And just in case you thought it was just European-based cultures, um, this is really mega increasing in Southeast Asia today, which is one of the primary zones of the world's ultra wealthy. In 2012, I know that's a few years back, but um, a pair of patrons in Hong Kong, Wong and Lu, um, donated over $300 million just to build the museum that they were going to use and name them from themselves to house their personal art collection. So instead of just owning it and storing it and only um, letting some people see it, they actually built a gigantic structure. So that's not even the cost of all the materials that they put inside. So we continue to do this. And, but again, also this one, sharing information in a public setting, that's increasing. Okay, so let's go um, through these last couple parts. I know uh, a lot of times this isn't the, um, okay. Oh, yes, um, yes, uh, going back, I, I saw something from a few minutes ago in regards to Pompeii. Yes, the entire sequence of the eruption was documented and written about. Ships that were anchored in the harbor, there were many days of gassing out and ash. It had um, erupted in uh, historic periods before, and so people with ships got on their ships and moved them way out into the harbor. So in case there were any lava bombs or anything else, they didn't lose their ships, and stayed out in the harbor and watched the whole thing occur. And then most of the city evacuated, and those people also gave oral or written histories of it. So we have a really great record of what happened at Pompeii. And I think Herculaneum, the information is, is just is, is interesting. So I know. Um, oh, not, not quite like how well we record our disasters today, but, but very, very similar to what goes on when we have horrible things happening now. So we're going to look just how we get from that 1300s to the 1700s, the first part. What is it that's really changing? The big things. Uh, it uh, no, it, it looks like um, just because of the type of eruption that it was that I, do, I haven't read that any of the boats caught fire that moved far enough out into the bay um, or that burned down. Of course, you didn't want to be breathing it, but people were already living in lives where they were breathing in right smoke all the time because that's how they were heating and lighting everything in their environments. So they probably didn't really even notice it rest, uh, in terms of respiratory interest. Um, on that one. Okay, so what are the big ideas that change that move this collection, curiosity, um, ancient speculation to beginning to get to um, the way that we proceed and, and think of archaeology today? One of the big changes that happens during those few centuries in Western viewpoint is that they began to see people and people them, humanity, as something you could study. Prior to that, it really wasn't. It really wasn't. Um, the dominance of a uh, worldview that said that nothing had ever changed over time and that a perfect supernatural creator created everybody on the planet and then that was it. There's nothing more to study about it. Um, and the fact that suggesting that anything had ever changed or that the world was really old was actually illegal for many centuries in Europe. And so this was not, it's not a radical idea to most of you, but it was a very radical idea during the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. So they began to see humans and human societies as part of nature, and they would be able to take a look and think rationally about why changes happened or why people were in some area or what they were doing. So reason, analysis, individualism, those things were big changes at the time and we're the inheritors of that. And then 
again from this, particularly getting into the Enlightenment, the starting the development of the concept that you would create experiments or structured observation and study of things, whether it was something uh, like erosion or whether it was something like human societies learning to use new technologies and when that happened. Okay, yeah, all stuff that should ring a bell with you, right? Because that's the way that our society works today. Mostly, not for every single person. Number two, humans changed over time. That was an illegal concept until well, uh, well along closer to the 1600s, that you would never suggest that anything had really changed um, drastically with humans, that there were foreigners and there were people living in other places. But this idea that the way that humans survived, the things that they knew how to do and so forth, um, and that cultures had come and go for a variety of reasons, wasn't something that people were really actually thinking about or worried about. Really, it wasn't that much curiosity. The other one, remains of things are evidence. So it also, during this particular time, material remains, right? Artifacts, ecofacts, features, and the sites and settlements themselves, they could be looked at scientifically the same way anything could be looked at scientifically, that they could use them to document the reality of the past. And a lot of times, just like what happens today in certain kinds of publications and media and so forth, it was over romanticized and they got these stories that really conformed more to the person writing about them than it did to the ancient society. But these are the three biggest ideas, that humans are studyable and the things that humans do are studyable, that humans have changed or altered lots of things about themselves, their society, their survival over time, and that then we would want to collect artifacts, ecofacts, features, and evidence in order to figure that out. So those are three big, they don't seem revolutionary to us now, right? Because this happened centuries ago. Is this something that every group of people in the US today um, are comfortable with? No, there are still a strong, a small, but strongly vocal uh, group of people in the US that don't believe that uh, humans have been around for a long time, that the world is very old, or that they are, that there's any purpose to study what we've been doing. So for instance, like this one, recognition that stone tools are artifacts. Okay, so something that pops up in archaeology all the time and that will be something for our course is thinking about the term analogy. So an analogy is when we use something that we know that we have a lot of information about or that we've seen or experienced or that um, in your textbook in chapter one, they talk about using ethnography, which is page 29, ethnography. In other words, going and visiting other cultures and talking to them and having them tell you how you make, how they make something, why they make it, what they used to do, um, what they want to continue doing, um, why they might not want to stop doing things in a particular way and so forth, right? So that's looking at the indigenous cultural um, viewpoint. So if we look at what we're doing in a modern sense, in order to understand ancient things, this was also uh, kind of a new concept at that particular point. So we have, and you don't have to jot this down, it won't be the text of a question, but just as, a, as an example, um, a, a writer in 1699 looking at an artifact of a stone tool that was recovered um, or discovered in France said, um, you know, well, I know that lots of us used to see these things and they're very small and you've always said that they were probably made by elves or fairies, in other words, a supernatural world, but I'm noticing that they look just like the same kind of tools that 
Native Americans in New England, that would be in the US today, um, used to make arrowheads. And so, right, so it went from ancient things being fantastic and supernatural to ancient things being data and evidence about other societies. So that allows then, what is science? Systematic study of material remains and linking them to a particular human society at a specific time and place. So temporal time, spatial space. Oh, this particular quote, just in case you might want to look at it, comes from the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford. It was written before 1700. All right. So getting to the science part, and this is directly in your reading as well. Let me go back. I have all of those there. The first globally recorded scientific excavation for amazingly enough, was conducted by Thomas Jefferson, among his many other scientific and exploration and literary things that he was doing, and didn't happen until the end of the 1780s. He took notes, he wrote down what they were doing step by step. I don't think he was actually doing the digging, but as you know, he owned slaves and had a lot of um, household workers there, and owned a tremendous amount of properties. And as it mentions in your reading, Going over to the um, uh, the uh, part one um, in chapter one thirty thirty one um, and so forth through that area that um, that he was verifying something that he thought before he started was that these large mounds and the artifacts with them were made by Native Americans, not by people from outer space, not by uh, people from um, that were currently living in Central America, uh, not by um, supernatural beings, that they were the product of the ancestors of tribal peoples that he knew, met, and had seen. So what was the result of this? As they mentioned, nobody really actually immediately followed his process. But sometime later, when people were beginning to think about excavating, again, looking at his notes or knowing that he had done it that way and it made um, a certain um, result more easy to come to, did eventually be inspiring. So he was calling these mounds that are found in the American Midwest and East Coast barrows, because they were already called that in Europe, um, as you uh, take a look, take a look at. Um, but we call them now burial mounds. Not all tribal zones in North America actually built these kinds of um, mounds um, for burials or cemeteries. Others did it in a totally different way. But um, this particular one that he excavated was called the the Indian grave. This particular illustration was actually done by someone else, not by Jefferson, but it's just a good ex excavation um, illustration. And here you can see already here, uh, getting close to the end of the 1700s, 1800s, that they're looking at stratigraphy. You can see the layers here, um, and the um, artist, the illustrator, is labeling them as to what they found. So you can see one here in this layer that there were burials here where they were laying um, on your extended on the back. There was one up here that was placed in sitting up in a small, a smaller chamber that was placed in later on. There were artifacts here and at the very bottom of it they found that somebody, that initially there was a burial there with a um, stone lined um, sort of room um, at the bottom where the remains were placed, some items, and then there was a ceiling over it, and then they built the rest of it over, over time. Most of these, unfortunately, sadly, 
for in Native American people and for all the rest of us too. Most of these have been plowed over for modern either agricultural development, um, so they can do, so they don't have to go up and down um, with farming and things like that, or plowed over for roads or plowed over for modern um, settlements. There are very, very few of them left today that have not been seriously looted or mainly pulled down, but there's some. So, uh, no worried about, please don't worry about specific vocabulary at this point. Uh, charnel house, for, this is just what did a scientific excavation look like? They didn't just dig a hole straight down and see what was in there in the center. They actually took it down layer by layer in order to expose the sequence of excavations. So this is a temporal excavation. So the question here is time. Okay, so again, a couple things that I just mentioned in the last few minutes um, that were concepts being developed in the Renaissance and Enlightenment periods and then incorporated into the growth of science, whether you were looking at chemistry, astronomy, archaeology, whatever it was, standardized methods. So techniques that everybody uses when they're performing that type of excavation. Record keeping. Record keeping, you all, means measurement, um, quantification of the data. It means looking for statistical pattern. And then publishing. Oops, me typing standing up, such an interesting thing. And then the use of inductive and deductive reasoning. So inductive reasoning, you make a hypothesis. You say, this looks an awful lot like something that I saw in Louisiana, but I'm in North Carolina. I think that they are similar. Therefore, I'm going to investigate the similarity by conducting this type of excavation. That's inductive reasoning. That's what a hypothesis is. Deductive reasoning means at the end of collecting all of your data, you make a prediction um, based on the results of your analysis. So same things that we still do that you learn about in your science classes. Okay, so by the middle 1800s, Again, same ideas, just a slightly different vocabulary here, more specific to archaeology. We have the very beginnings of modern archaeology. While Jefferson's excavation was earlier than the 1800s, by mid-1800s, we see that people in a variety of places are following these standards. So really careful. In other words, they're digging very slowly. They just don't go out with machinery or shovels or buckets and try to find if anything's under there. They're doing it layer by layer. And again, um, you don't need the, um, these terms down here, but again, it's just a good illustration of what happens when you dig slowly and you're looking at layers, stratigraphy, when you see the layers. Uh, here in Southern California, we have a lot of layers that are tipped up on the side, but they were originally applied horizontally. That'll be another different activity for class, just the term stratigraphy is all you need right now. So stratification. Then they are keeping records of everything they do because, I've probably said it like 10 times already, but archaeology is a destructive process. We have to be so careful. We have to have lots of ways to um, collect data, share data, and so forth, because once we excavated, it is destroyed. 
for the future. So we want to be sure that we do the best we can. And there are lots of places in the world where countries don't want to start excavating in places that are unique or incredibly valuable because they want to wait and see if there might be more techniques to figure out what's going on that are not destructive, um, at least for the first few um, sequences. So um, ground penetrating radar, um, LIDAR, some other ways that we can begin to get an idea of things. Um, because once you open up some of these things in the ground, things begin to decompose, things disappear, and then the whole pattern of it disappears. So, and then logical conclusions from carefully excavated evidence. Everything gets labeled, everything gets measured, everything goes into, and it's you've got an inventory, and it goes to a central place where there's oversight in regards to the analysis. So reasonable conclusions based on data, not stories, right? Not matching your what you found to mythology or what you were hoping to find. Does it always work? No, it doesn't always work, right? It's very difficult to separate the researcher from the researcher's um, conclusions. That's why we need new people, new generations, new viewpoints. Okay, so again, just the term stratigraphy again, just can't emphasize that this is what you see all the time when we're excavating strata. And so again, as we go down, right, temporal dimension, we're looking at the history of what happened here. They are digging this down and seeing there was this layer with this um, road bed, then earlier it looked like this, earlier there's this one, here's some more down here, here's some other deposits. This is actually a hole that somebody dug and then filled back up and you've got other things getting older and older the farther down you go. So if it's just a, a picture of an excavation going down where you see lots of layers, then the question is time or temporal dimension. Okay, who are the first professional archaeologists and really what is their first system that they're working on so for you all three age system comes up pages 26 and 27 in your reading so pages 26 and 27 talk about this and there are very early stages of this when they talk about stone age briar bronze age iron age that three age system definitely western viewpoint where everything's in threes morning noon and night youth, maturity, seniority, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It just goes on and on. So again, 1800s though is when we start seeing these people. So this idea of social evolution becomes common. Now in your reading in chapter one, it begins to emphasize the, um, the influence of biology, the new science of biology, the term biology only dates to around 1800, not too much earlier than that, um, the new science of biology and the development of evolutionary thought, how important that is where people working within a scientific context begin to see that they want to see what the sequence of changes is and what and what's causing change. And that's how you get to um, processual, right? A process is a series of things. It's motion. Um, so how are we studying change and how are we documenting those changes? In the 1700s, Scandinavian scholars started with savagery, barbarism, and civilization. Unfortunately, even though this is over 300 years old as a concept, we still use these terms, but they're always used in a derogatory manner. The tribal societies are savage, or barbaric, and uh, people living in cities are civilized, and um, or people who are educated, or people who are wealthy, or people that come from certain parts of the world. So this is very, very old terminology. It's not really what we use today, but the same concept. So, first beginnings that really, while um, Thomas Jefferson tried it, 
he didn't end up mentoring or training anyone else or influencing anyone else directly. So the first person who really puts it out, prints it up, trains students, and starts the whole new framework is uh, this individual here, Augustus Henry Lane Fox Pitt Rivers, yeah, wealthy family, so they tended to name, if both of the parents came from wealthy or prominent backgrounds, they tended to give the children all the family names from both sides for that. So about the late 1800s, the end of the Victorian society. And Victorians are very notable for wanting to study things. This is when we get a big increase in not only thinking about chemistry, but anatomy, um, breakthroughs, that are the product of other grim activities for um, uh, medical kinds of treatments, um, understanding the human body by digging up lots more corpses, um, right? Just lots and lots of that type of science curiosity. And so understanding the human past is, is part of that. So he actually passed away in 1900. So in the middle 1800s, he was learning to do this. You can see these people were celebrated in their time. Some of these ones mentioning, these are very formal portraits. They're really dressed up. They're showing social markers that they were considered influential in their lives. Now, how was it that many of these early scientific archeology span types were beginning to do things in a more procedural step-by-step scientifically oriented way. And one of the main reasons, or one of the main things that links them together is that many of them had military backgrounds before or during while they were doing this kind of work. So again, um, Lane Fox Pitt Rivers, he actually was had a title of general, and you will find that on page 33 in your reading, showing some of his, um, and then goes on to uh, summarize a couple of the other people that we'll look at real quickly here in our last few minutes. So this one, again, just bringing your attention to in there. So his interest in archeology span begins about 1850 and partly because of British military and British colonialism, they're going to places in the world that they're fascinated by. In uh, your chapter one in your textbook mentions um, uh, Squire, Haven, Wesley Powell, and Cyrus Thomas, um, and the, it mentions the mound builder cultures. I am not, you all, here's one you definitely want to jot this down, I'm not going to ask you any specific questions about these people for this test, because in unit three we're going to look at them in specific, because we'll be looking at North America, ancient North America in specific in another unit. So for this one, um, no, no test or quiz questions for this one. So we'll move on. So the next individual that's mentioned in your reading, though so another one of the very notable pioneers of systematic excavation and analysis, Sir Leonard Woolley. Again, born right at the end of uh, Pitt Rivers um, lifetime, he became very, very famous for excavating in the Middle East and so was the first um, systematic excavator of the one of the world's oldest known cities, the city of Ur. Um, you would call this Mesopotamia um, for that. He uh, did have to serve in military service and then came back. He was very socially well preserved, um, um, received and had many, many notable uh, friends and um, researchers, including for those of you where this is a, um, a gen ed requirement for you, and so you've got to find the fun parts where you can. One of his friends was actually another archaeologist by the name of Max Mallowan, and his wife was Agatha Christie. There's the reasons why Agatha Christie's early crime novels were not only so well received and so different than what had been produced before, but also are still so readable. She was in the heart and soul of the beginnings of seeing how scientific ex um, uh, exploration, right? Having a question, looking for evidence, asking more questions, fact checking, and moving through to deduction based on your collected evidence would be something she could incorporate into the humanness part of her stories. And she wrote 
um, prodigiously and people still love reading her books, but it's why it was, it wasn't just personalities or emotion. She was thinking scientifically. Flinders Petrie, he's another one mentioned. Flinders Petrie did most of his work in Egypt. And um, in this particular um, circumstance, um, again, er earlier than Wooly, I'm, I'm just sort of putting them all in there in whatever order that I type them up here. When Flinders Petrie during his lifetime was openly acknowledged as a really nasty, mean, non-friendly, hard to get along with person. And because he was so difficult, he didn't marry until he was quite um, much later, probably partly because he just wasn't considered real desirable that way for that one. But he was an Egyptologist and his scientific contribution was developing um, the ways of statistically analyzing artifacts, in particular ceramics, um, for this. Now, one of the things I want you to see over here in this one, this woman here, later in life, somebody did agree to marry him, um, a woman by the name of Hilda. She married him because she wanted to be an archaeologist. And most of these early archaeologists that are female, the only way you could participate in these was via your husband. It's the only way you would get a permit, um, travel documents, or have a purpose there. So she was also an Egyptologist um, going along. And so quite a few of these um, early individuals, their wives were also participating, not all of them, but in many cases. In the modern world, and we did look at these um, these two people um, a couple times ago, uh, like four times ago, maybe, when we talked about the Wheeler Kenyon method for creating wide or clearing excavations by leaving the bulk, leaving the little walls in between in order to be able to map it better and so forth. He, again, extremely important um, in modern archaeology, so Mortimer Wheeler. Kathleen Kenyon. Kathleen Kenyon was one of the first humans that we know of that was biofemale that conducted her own full scale, um, um, very scientifically and historically significant uh, research um, projects. Mm -hmm. Here in this picture, Wheeler's wife, Tessa Verney Wheeler, was an archaeologist in her own right. So again, this would be the pathway when people were underrepresented or were not uh, not able to be included in the wrong way. There was lots of uh, readings. Um, so pages 26 to 32, we'll just uh, linger on this for a moment so you can see what it is that you're looking for when you're taking notes um, for these. There's lots of commentary from the 1900s, eight, end of the 1800s and through most of the 1900s, probably all the way up until probably early 1960 or so, that part of the reason that women were not able to be archaeologists, because these leaders of archaeology, they weren't doing most of the digging, right? They had low uh, paid, low waged um, local workers that lifted the buckets, moved things, got dirty, rinsed things off and so forth. They were mainly either calling the shots, doing the recording, uh, taking the notes, or doing indoor laboratory research, all of which had to happen anyway. Um, just generally, they didn't do the dirt part. Um, so, but there are comments like, well, women couldn't be invited to the um, projects because after all, their shoes had pointy heels and if they walked on the surfaces, they'd be destroying the archaeologist, the archaeology. Um, initially, there was no clothing that women could wear to do archaeologists because pants were not allowed. So the whole culotte thing with the giant looks like a skirt, but they really kind of have a pant leg so you could go up and down a ladder, for instance, um, and be... Um, be able to participate a little bit. And then even um, really honestly, even stuff that I was coming in contact with as a college student, um, people mm, uh, making comments or um, rude conclusions or laughing and, as if it was true that if you invited females on an archeological project, then all, this would be a problem for the male archeologists and the, those that were in committed relationships or wives, because after all, the only reason those women archeologists were there was to go after the married men and have sex on the project. Um, it is true, uh, just as far as my experience is, that a lot of people when they are in the field for a prolonged period of time are gonna act like humans and be mixing it up 
the, in their tent or hotel room or the bushes or whatever it is. But I don't know any professional archaeologists, including myself, that would have ever risked our career by getting involved with anyone or even bringing our own relationships into the into the field thing. But but I do know sometimes when it's all students out there that that's happening. So again, what are they talking about? These are all there to get you to that section of the reading called processual archaeology. How do we study change over time? So this is being recorded. I'll give you the link to it. It won't be ready for today, but I should be able to post it for you tomorrow. These are not, uh, and again, this is for the exam. The quiz is not talking about the history chapter, which is why we did the other stuff first. Okay, now overlooked archaeologists. There's a section in your reading on females. So um, that's why we didn't, I didn't run these two. But uh, here's an individual that's extremely important in the United States, and he'll be our last one for today, um, which is actually one of the only African American or black archaeologists um, uh, that we historically know of, John Wesley Gilbert. Um, as you can see, fantastically handsome and young um, uh, man. He um, learned um, and had a lot of expertise in being able to read and work within ancient languages. He also was an expert at making maps, and so his, um, he was interested in ancient Greece and traveled there, and um, Black or African American um, individuals were more welcomed and better uh, had better opportunities if they left the U.S. and went to Europe and some other countries than they did actually here. Um, so he was the first African American who got a master's degree in 1891 um, from Brown University in Georgia. And eventually when he finished uh, some of this um, exploration and discovery part of his career, he came back to the United States and was a Greek and English instructor at Payne College in the United States. So definitely one of the lost but extremely significant figures in this. All right, we'll call it a moment here. So it's already Thursday. Right? It, to me, it seems like it's still Tuesday. Um, if you haven't finished up the quiz, go and get things organized and go in and, and complete that one. Next Tuesday, we are going to meet in Zoom first. If you have any last questions or anything else, um, then you'll log out of Zoom when I'm done and the exam will open up for you in Canvas. If you go to Canvas first, the exam's not gonna let you in. It's gonna let you in after we finish with a little warm up and just get you kind of focused as going in this. This um, unit exam is not gonna be super long, so it's not gonna take you uh, very many minutes to complete it. It's really just to get us started. All right, thank you those of you that are here today. I'm going to. Uh, stop the recording.